Analysts may have an idea or some prior knowledge they wish to test regarding the relationship between variables. In some cases, theory provides this knowledge. Other times, it's experience. These are known as hypothesis tests. However, many times analysts may not have this knowledge, which is known as a priori knowledge, and thus may need to explore the data. Exploratory data analysis will allow for a deep dive into the data set, thereby examining relationships among the variables, examine interesting subsets of the observations, and cultivate some initial notion of the associations for future use in additional testing. When we present data, it's important to understand the audience. The audience of any analysis can be more visual, analytical, or even abstract. Graphs are a great way to represent data visually, and different graphs can demonstrate different properties of data, but be careful of scale. Scale can skew what one of your observers interprets about the data. Summary descriptives are a great way to measure a variable, as we talked about. These include the average, the mean, the median, the mode, and so forth. And we use the summary function in R. Categorical tables will provide an overview of the groups of data. And these will be referred to as contingency tables. It's very important to understand your audience and the level of detail that your audience is looking for. The first step for analysis is to understand the data that's being examined. And this includes total number of rows, total number of columns, along with the type of each column, the number of missing observations, and obvious mistakes in the data. Now, when we take the data and we begin to graphically analyze, we have a number of different options. And each graph has an advantage or disadvantage based on the data available. First, we have histograms, which are very common to tell us frequency counts, stem and leaf plots, which are similar and related to histograms, box plots, which will tell us more about a particular column, scatter plots, the relationship between two columns, and line charts, which will give us more information about time-based information. So a histogram is simply a column chart of the frequency table. Data is collected into certain bins, which are ranges of data. The bins are frequencies. The bins for the frequencies are very important. If you have too many bins or too few bins, you won't be able to see a distribution well. Normally between five and 10 bins should suffice to see the shape or distribution of the data. Here we have an example where we have category labels, zero to 50, 51 to 60, and so forth. And we have the frequency counts. We can produce a chart from it and see the distribution. And we see the semblance of a normal distribution with maybe a problem here at 51 to 60. Now, in this example, we have the air quality data set. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to do a histogram using the ggplot function. ggplot is another library that gives us very rich graphs. And here we'll use this function to actually produce the histogram. And we could see that the histogram has the number of uh, and we can see that the histogram has the count for each one of the buckets. And we have seven buckets that are in this histogram. The one below uses the standard R plotting, and its default is using five buckets. Box plots are an excellent way of depicting differences among groups of a variable by displaying data as a measure of their respective quartiles. The strong middle line recall in each block represents the median. The center block the center box represents the second quartile below the median and the third quartile above the median, which we call the interquartile range. The dashed lines represent the first quartile and fourth quartile below the box and above the box. Outliers are denoted by circles or sometimes asterisks, uh, either above or below those quartiles. Remember, those are done using the two-key fence method. What this does is this allows us to compare the individual items, say experiment number one versus experiment number two. One of the things we look for is we look for that middle line to see if the middle line falls within the interquartile of another box for another group. If they do, in general, it means that there's no statistical difference between the groups. What this also does is this tells us the distribution or the shape of a particular group. So for example, group two is fairly normal because there's an even spread around that median line between the interquartile ranges, between the interquartile range and the whiskers. However, group three and group five definitely have a problem and are probably not normal. Group three has a very, very small Q1, a very, very small Q2, while three and four are a little bit bigger. Again, that could be a problem of the size of the data in experiment three. Here we have two ways of doing box plots in R. We can use the ggplot again, where we'll use the geom box plot, 
providing some of the options here. And we'll use the standard R plot doing the same thing. Line charts provide a graphical representation of linear data, usually time-based, but not always. It's generally easy to place a number of lines on the same graph for comparison. Again, the top one will give us how we're going to do this using ggplot, and the bottom one using the standard R plot. Scatter plots place individual observations on an XY coordinate scale, known as Cartesian coordinates. Scatter plots are excellent ways of visualizing trends, possible groupings, anomalies, outliers, or gaps in the data. Lines, such as regression lines, can be added to the scatter plot for additional insight if needed. In the example on the right, we can clearly see that there exists a relationship between eruption duration and waiting time between eruptions. What's also interesting here is that we see two groups. We see one group below at the bottom left and one group above at the top right. And so there's a gap in between. And so that gap might be interesting. Scatter plots will easily show the correlations of the two sets of data, and they're used in understanding for regression. Here we have two examples of producing the scatter plot, one using the GG plot and the other using the standard R plot. Now when working with large data sets, there are occasions when looking at a subset is more practical. When the data set is too large and a random subset will provide strong information about the overall data set. So for example, we would take a very large data set of 100,000 rows and we can take a random subset because due to the law of large numbers, if it's large enough, it should represent an entire population. We can run small random subset models to test various hypotheses faster. It may take a little bit longer to run a model with a million rows than it does with, say, 20,000 rows, but we should get similar results. And we can even run smaller subsets three or four times. We can examine a specific subset, such as gender, for examining smaller effects, or class size, smaller classes versus larger classes. We can also create a subset of multiple variables to explore relationships of those variables. So we don't need to use all of the columns. We can use a subset of columns to begin exploring some of those little pieces first. Here's an example of how we subset. We take the air quality, and what we'll do first is we will use the air quality where the temperature field is greater than 80, and we will say that we only want to use the ozone and temperature columns. So it's important to note that when we do this type of subsetting, we're going to be using air quality twice. We're going to be using it as an input into the rows, and then we're going to use it to get the columns after that input is done. Similarly, we can use the subset command. Similarly, we can use the subset function, where we pass in the air quality as the data set, saying make the temperature greater than 80 and only give us the two columns, ozone and temperature. Now, in some data sets with a continuous variable or many categorical variables, we can use binning to categorize different observations. While it's entirely up to the analyst to determine the method to be employed, some common methods of binning include use the median as a marker for high or low, use quartiles for four bins, or you can do the 33rd and 66th percentile for three bins, things below 33, below 66, and above 66. Use some known approximation for bins, let's say from research. Researchers in a lot of different fields have already figured out some standard binning. And you can parse data for meaningful breaks, such as gaps or spikes. In the scatter plot chart that we saw before, we might actually create a bin somewhere around that middle point where that gap occurred so that we can actually only use the bottom half and the top half. Now, there's no limit to the amount of data that can be derived from any given data set. The analyst must be creative and understand the domain being studied. So, for example, you can create 12 fields from the date and time. Fields like quarter, week month, day of week, day of month, and so forth. Now, multiple factors can be combined to create bins such as cohorts and days. We can create bins using multiple fields as our criteria, such as customer purchased, customer purchased in the month of May, and customer used a credit card, and that might be one bin, and we might have a few different categories of that. Continuous variables can be modified by applying a function such as e or log for transformations. We can take any variable, perform a mathematical operation that makes sense, and use that as input into a new variable or an output. 